Welcome into debate night, everybody. We are back for yet another season. Uh, the off-season podcast is done. It is time to move in for the 2024 Pro Tour season. We're back yet again. We're going to be doing this weekly, just like last year. There's a few new twists, but we're bringing, and we're also going to bring back uh, some old faces you might recognize, but a bunch of new guests as well this year, which should be a lot of fun. Um, but before we get into that, we've got a quick word from foundation disc golf uh we're thrilled to announce our exclusive weekly text deals that offer incredible discounts on your favorite discs merch and accessories get ready to score amazing savings and elevate your collection each week our team handpicks from our inventory or places a specific order to find the best deal we can possibly offer we text you a limited time offer on the hand selected item you text us back with how many of the discs last item you want and your order is in it's just that easy if you're on your phone click the link in the description or text the word join to one eight three three. 255-8270. So make sure to check that out. It's a really cool new thing that we've launched. And like I said, the link is in the description to sign up for that. But without further ado, let's introduce our analyst for today. We have Brody Smith in the house. He's returning, not standing. And he's, got a, Puka, he's got a Puka Nakua rookie card. It's game over. Yeah. Um, we've got Dustin returning, self-declaring himself the champ of 2023, which I wouldn't argue with. Yeah, you know, objectively speaking, uh, I mean, you can go look at the stats. But anyway, it's also nice to be doing this actually at night. So this is uh, yeah, it's real debate, debate night. night. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, yeah we did. tell me about it. Yeah, it's super nice. It's almost night for for Brody. Um, no, 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 no. I'm happy. About okay. it. Like, there was, okay. there was I can never tell. There, there was a there tone was... of sarcasm to that. I, <laughs> yeah. There was concerned. multiple. Well, first off, the show was debate night because we did it at night, and then there mm -hmm. was multiple times where I was waking up at like six in the morning to do yeah. the show. And never will debate will, before dawn was we'll always yeah. the show. We could have yeah. called it that. Um, Hunter's true. here with a new camera. Yeah, I just wanted to say, Trevor, fantastic hat. Also, something to think about, guys. When does night end and morning begin? So it might have been debate night the whole time. Um, that is true. And uh, we're joined today by Lucas, who is a new guest joining. Yep. What's up? I'm Lucas. Uh, I'm going to be back on foundation again. <laughs> That's true. We did uh, battle Lucas in uh, Knoxville in a bogey row battle. I won't I was gonna tell say, you. He looks familiar. I won't Lucas, tell you who welcome. won, but we, we are also undefeated. I played with you at Bedford, Brody. Oh, heck yeah. Oh, there you go. Double connection there. All right. Yes, well, we're going to connections. All we're going to get place. into our topics. Uh, I will mention everybody watching the show. If you haven't watched the show before, the way it works is each of our contestants will give their their answers. Um, to the following prompts that I list, and then I will assign points based on how well they compose their argument, how strong their points are, and the the uh, guest analyst with the the most points at the end will be the winner. There'll be one final topic, so we'll do four topics, and then a final fifth topic at the end that will only have two people in it, and that'll kind of be the final one. Uh, there'll be normally up to five points up for grabs, and on that final topic, there'll be up to 10 points up for grabs, so a big chance for somebody to make a comeback there. Uh, each contestant has 90 seconds to make their argument and then two minutes for the final argument. And it's just that simple. So, um, yeah. And if you listened last year, one of the main changes, we are going to be assigning the points after the fact. So that way people aren't talking and like watching their point total at the same time, a little distracting. So, uh, yeah, always, as always, let us know in, in the comments, what kind of feedback you have. This is a show that we like to, uh, try and perfect and, we're going to get right into it. So first question, we obviously are coming out of an off season that was pretty exciting. Some, some nice moves this year. Um, and a lot of times we do winners and losers of the off season, but I wanted to change it up a little bit. Instead of just asking you for your winner of the off season, I want to know which manufacturer do you believe performed higher than their expectations this off season and why, uh, obviously performance, you can kind of chalk that down to player movement. They conducted marketing, they executed, et cetera. You know, we're thinking of them as businesses. So I want to know who performed higher than their expectations. Uh, Brody lead us off. So I think the the easy answer here, I think, is going to be MVP. I think, you know, them signing, obviously, the biggest name with Eagle McMahon, I think that was obviously gave him a little bit of an advantage there. But instead of just doing a normal signing, having him sit down in front of a camera and say, oh, I'm going to MVP, excited about that, they ended up doing, you know, a pretty good job of faking everyone out, misdirecting everyone, thinking that they were going to announce a release of a new disc, uh, I think also the way they incorporated another one of their players with Simon Lazat was great. And then they just have a plethora of content that was created that I think was pretty engaging for, um, you know, MV MVP fans, but then also Eagle fans 
between Simon and Eagle leading up to the announcement. So that's a pretty easy one. They also signed Silva, uh, which I have projected as potentially someone that could push Kristen Tatar in the FPO division. So very interested to see kind of what that happens with Sarah Hokum on the FPO side as well. Paul Kranz, everyone keeps talking about this Paul Kranz kid, super high ceiling with him. So yes, they, they have Simon and Eagle who I don't even think Eagle really is considered older, but you know, so they're, they're saying, you know, Simon Eagle went over there. Now this is more of the younger side. Paul Kranz is the biggest up and comer, but West side, I think can sneak in there. Because I think their video with Matty O was probably executed the best out of everyone. Okay. Okay. Yeah. MVP, definitely. Uh, a lot of people considering them a, a front runner this year. Um, not a huge surprise. Um, but, you know, Westside, that's, that's a pretty good shout, too, because I, I'd agree. I think that the Matty O re recapture was very nice. Dustin, do you agree? What do you think? I actually think, you know, Brody's pretty spot on. Like, obviously, grabbing Eagle was huge. The content they've done around it's huge. Reuniting the Crush Boys, that whole thing, that's big. And I, I agree on Silva Styron, too. I mean, this is a player who kind of came out of nowhere and had some huge finishes last year and can expand MVP into the European market and be the face of FPO for MVP going forward with Sarah Hokum kind of hitting that master jays. Um, but what I will say is, unfortunately for MVP, the rumor mill kind of churned out a lot about Eagle, like right up before the announcement. And so unfortunately, it took a situation where like they would have definitely seen expectations to where it kind of took away the surprise a little bit. And I think that's not out of the, not, not, you know, not in their control, but unfortunately, it is kind of how it happened. So my answer is actually going to be DGA. And it's because I don't think many people had expectations out of them outside of Katrina Allen and Amara Weed, but they pick up Sullivan Tipton, who had multiple top 25 finishes at Elite or Higher events last year. They picked up Evan Scott, who won a silver event and had multiple top 30 finishes at Elite or Higher events this year. They got Jake Mon, who had a couple top 30s in his own right. Then you pick up Parker Welk, who won DDO and had several other top 25 finishes, including USDGC. And then you have Tristan Tanner, who had three top 25 finishes last year. He's also got a decent sized YouTube channel and some content once he gets that back going. And then they grabbed some huge FPO names like Macy Valdez was a massive steal right after that whole dynamic disc drama and all that. They, they really capitalized on that. And then you got Ellie Ezra. This is a huge up and coming player in FPO with massive power. Uh, looks like she could definitely be a future talent. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and give it to DGA for uh, exceeding expectations. OK, yeah, I really like that pick. Honestly, I uh, whenever I really looked down the list and saw all the players they had signed this year, like I just couldn't believe how much of the young talent they were able to pick up. It just seems like they're going all in on the young guns and hoping that some of them will merge. And I also really like that they moved in for Macy Velo Diaz. I think that there is uh, definitely some good PR for that. Brody, do you have something? Sorry, I should ask this before the show. Are we doing like a rebuttal thing after the rounds if we completely disagree with someone at all? Or what's, how's that working? I'll, I'll let gone? you rebuttal. If you if you could have a complete disagreement with somebody, I'm not saying it's going to oh, be okay. worth any points, but you know, I'll let sure. you, I'll let you oh, get, I don't you, care get off you your know chest. Me, I don't care about the points. I don't care. It was never points. about the points for you. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> okay, well, uh, on to Hunter now. Hunter, who is who exceeded expectations in your eyes? Oh, I was waiting for Brody's rebuttal. Uh, no, I think that the two most obvious answers were the two that were just given, uh, MVP and DGA, and I would agree both of them exceeded expectations. Um, the problem Dustin brought up was very valid of MVP. The problem was can you exceed expectations if the expectation became worse that you better sign Eagle McMahon, and then you did that. I don't know. That's kind of a tough, tough one there. DGA, I think it's it's phenomenal. You know, their off season was kind of expected to be non-existent. No one was talking about it. They picked up a ton of talent. Problem is, come the end of the season, is that talent really going to amount to much? They took the risk. I think that it could work out. I'm going to go a sneaky one here. Um, I'm actually going to go with Discraft. Why on earth would I go with Discraft? Well, going into the offseason, there was expectation, at least on my end, that they were going to lose at least one of their key players. There was a lot of players, especially on the FPO side, that were coming up with their contracts running out. And some of the ones I'll list here, three main ones, the three-headed snake, Paige Pierce, Valerie Mandahano, Holland Handley, and they were able to land all three of them. Paige Pierce actually just announced a two-year contract extension. And on top of that, they were able to pick up Hannah Wynn and Chris Clemens. Uh, not really much expectations on their offseason, and it's not like this is like they're the biggest win of the offseason, but with not much expectation and the chance of losing very key roles, I think that exceeded my expectations this offseason. So I'm going to land on Discraft. Okay. Yeah. I like that. I, I, you know, when you have a loaded roster like Discraft does, I think that, uh, you know, people only really expect you to do the big things, make the huge signings, but with all the players they had, they certainly were in a place where we could have seen them bleed a little bit and they were able to retain a lot of good players. So, uh, no doubt that Discraft, when you look down the list of manufacturers, that team is just insanely stacked. Can I say one thing real quick? 
Go they also it. did re-sign Aaron Gossage, so that was pretty big for them. As it well. is true. They got the goose as well. They, they have some uh, some good young talent, too. All right, Lucas, wrap it up for us. Who exceeded your expectations? So when we talk about expectations of the company, I think when you know early on in the, the offseason you're going to lose Eagle, you have to know you got to rebound quickly. And Dismania did more than rebound. I think they capitalized. Uh, of the top nine available guys on the board in MPO, they were able to grab three of them. Uh, no other brand picked up more than one from that top echelon of players. Um, I also created a spreadsheet that calculates the most lucrative off seasons of the companies based on three metrics, right. the world ranking of the player, the years they signed a player for, and uh, the All new right. deal versus an extension. Um, <laughs> I love so uh, this mania ended up winning that for MPO. And then on the FPO side, uh, there's a similar story kind of. There were six top 15 players available in FPO. And Discraft picked up three of those players, which was really keeping three players, while no other company got more than one. So there was no real excitement on the FBO side this year. It was more about maintaining what you've got. And Discraft understood that and protected an up-and-coming star in Holland Hanley, a tour veteran in Paige Pierce, and a, uh, a proven winner coming back from injury in Valerie Mandahano. So I think Dismania wins on MPO side and exceeding their own expectations after losing Eagle. Um, and then FPO wins it on the FPO side by being able to maintain uh, their t talent. Yeah. Okay. That's I a mean, question. go for it. So you said they, 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 this many to grab how many? Three of the top, how many? So there were nine of the top nine players on the board. They grabbed okay. three of them. What Not were those the top three? nine in the world. Uh, it was Niklas, Gannon, and Alden. Okay. Yeah, I, I, and listen, I'm uh, I'm always don't a fan. question the spreadsheet. I'm always a no, fan of spreadsheets. Curious. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm I'm impressed with that. I will say I I agree with the disc mania take. I think that um, their expectation it kind of goes to what Dustin and Hunter mentioned with MVP. Like we knew the expectation was they need to sign Eagle. So what did they do beyond that? Whereas uh, the expectation you could argue for disc mania was they they are going to lose Eagle. And in that case, did they exceed? Uh, what was thought they could do. Um, so yeah, I definitely see that side of things. Brody, what was your rebuttal? What did you have to say? My only rebuttal was to Dustin with the expectations. I agree, like DJ's expectations were super low, but I mean, that was one of the worst videos I think I've ever seen. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, and, and I think you said something along the lines of like, I'm going to pick a sneaky one. And I think the reason why they were sneaky is yes, they are all good players, but no one's really like talking about it because the way that it was executed with their signings, I think was really poor. I, I think they do have one of the better teams that, that was picked up this off season. It's again, just something that these companies need to figure out. Do you go the end of approach where it's like, Hey, we're not even going to announce that we're going to sign one of the top players that had an elite series win last year, like uh, Emerson Keith. And we're right. just going to do that. Or do you go like the West side approach where they went out to a third party, paid a lot of money to uh, to put out that uh, announcement with Matty O. So I think DGA kind of did something in the middle, and I think that's actually worse. I think yeah. you're better off just like doing nothing. The, the, uh, putting together like an I photo or <laughs> iMovie. I don't even know what that was. Can I get it an honorable mention really quick bad. at the end okay. here? Can yeah. I, I want to I give an honorable mention to Lone Star Dis for exceeding expectations and taking L's in the offseason. So uh, congratulations <laughs> yeah. to Lone Star on that one. It, right. they, um, yeah, they trended in the wrong direction. Um, all right, we're going to get a little bit further into the uh, offseason debate a little bit. And we're going to talk about the big one, which is obviously the Eagle and Gannon. Uh, obviously, it wasn't a swap um, in the sense that, um, you know, one wasn't with MVP and Dismania they didn't swap places, but essentially they each each company gained a, a new talent, and Dismania happened to lose one. So um, this offseason we saw Eagle land at MVP and Gannon land at Discmania. Many consider this a net loss for Discmania from a business perspective, even though they gained a potentially uh, potentially generational young talent in Burr to make up for Eagle's departure. Do you agree with this public consensus? If so, how can Discmania turn this swap into their favor? If not, explain why. Uh, Dustin, what do you think? I mean, I think that this is a fair way to look at it, like the way that you listed it. I mean, in the short term, it is a loss because Eagle is such a massive brand, and that's not only due to his on-course performance, but it's also just due to the brand itself, you know, being one of the crush boys, how far he throws, how much social media reach he has. When he does focus on putting out content, he has one of the bigger YouTube channels out there. Uh, he just has a massive brand to him. He has a lot of pop to his name, and I'm sure he moves a ton of plastic. Um, now, with that said you know, he became even more important when Simon left because he became the face of the company. Now, sure, they still had Kyle Klein 
And I do think he is overlooked a little bit. He does perform very well, but his brand does not have the same level of pop as someone like Eagle had. Um, and so I do think it is a loss in that regard. However, what I will say is this man did a good job by re-signing Nicholas Antla. They did it in a very weird way, but at least they got it done, and that helps from the European market. And yes, Burr has potential to bring them big wins on the course to make up for the loss of Eagle when it comes to pure results and the attention that he can bring by being on coverage and things of that nature if he performs at a high level. And I also do think that when you combine Gannon with Alden Harris and Gavin Babcock and that little trio that they have and, and, and the blogs that come out from Alden and all that jazz, that does give you a chance to eventually make some ground on the social media and content front, just as long as you don't mess with it too much. Like they're already doing a really cool natural thing. I don't want you know, this many to like artificially kind of manipulate how they deliver that product, but just supporting it and being there for it along for that ride. I think eventually this many can still wind up in a pretty good position with Eagle gone. Yeah, I, I good point. The uh, the vlog squad can't be overlooked. I think that's one of the most underutilized. I think Prodigy probably isn't taking enough advantage of that or wasn't uh, while they still had the majority of that group, but uh, certainly something to look into for them. Um, Hunter, what do you think? I, I agree with the public's consensus here, um, but I think there's a lot more going on than just a straight Eagle Gan swap. What I think is actually going on here is there's a lot more about the momentum of the business instead of a straight net win or loss. So let's take a look first at MVP here. So MVP, you go back just a few short years, they're at the bottom kind of of the food chain in a lot of ways, shapes, or forms. They signed James Conrad, have him go on to win Worlds. They then land the whale and Simon Lazat burst into one of the top manufacturers on the planet last season. Then they followed up by reuniting the Crush Boys this offseason with the landing of Eagle McMahon. Whereas Discmania, you go back a few years, in their peak, they have Simon Eagle, Eric Oakley, Paul McBeth, Nate Sexton, Avery Jenkins, and others throwing their plastic in some way, shape, or form. Then they lose ties to Innova, but they're able to hold on to Simon and Eagle at least. Then they try to spin off this new plastic. The loss of Simon definitely hurt, and now the last piece has fallen, which is Eagle, leaving their brand in just a big question mark. So I think it's more, more than just the loss of Eagle. They lost their brand this offseason because that was the last tie back to the good old days. So the move forward, you have a new way forward with your new vlog squad, if you will, a new kind of fun, goofy, young core. Um, and so I think this is time to rebrand, not necessarily in as far as like logos and stuff, but in your messaging and your marketing and the way you treat and view the brand. I think that's their way forward is just rebrand with this current group, make them part of the future. And I think they can have a lot of success ahead. Yeah, really well said. Um, I think that the... The key there, like you mentioned, is they now kind of almost feel, feels like they have a fresh slate and it's going to be interesting to see if they decide to pivot instead of just leaning into what was the old and trying to. Because like you said, the last tie they had to like that feel good old days uh, Innova made disc mania was kind of Eagle McMahon. And now it's, you know, a lot of new gen players. So it'll be interesting to see how, how they uh, navigate that. Uh, Lucas, what are your thoughts on this move? Yeah, so I actually don't agree with the public consent is on this for a few main reasons. Um, just like I mentioned in the last question, they're picking up a top three player in Gannon, two top 20s, this being Dismania, uh, two top 20 players. So I think just on a pure trade level, again, it's not a trade for trade like we see in other sports. The analyst would say Dismania wins that trade with for a, like a three for one, quote unquote. Uh, so second, Prodigy doesn't really have exciting discs. It's a well-known fact that unfortunately, the discs that most pros favor are not available to the public readily. So it sounds like uh, Gannon's describing a vintage car when he does it in the bag. Here we've got a 2018 run of super flat, a little bit chalky, uh, high parting line, uh, but it's only the lime green D3s. So like that's not readily available to the public. Gannon, uh, and also they didn't make Gannon push any of their cool new stuff. Uh, maybe the FX3, but that was it. So I don't think we've really seen his ability to move discs yet. Disc Mania is an exciting brand with good marketing design. Alden was able to get people interested, and I believe it was an F7 that was so flippy you can make it corkscrew at the Mid-America Open a couple years ago. So now imagine these guys being on a brand that makes plastic exciting and people are excited to buy. Yes, Eagle's going to do well at MVP, but how much of that market did Simon already capture when he went there? Finally, I think we have to look at Eagle's injury. It still looms large. We don't know what he's going to look like this year. He's had the surgery. He's taken the time to recover, but it's hard to get back both physically and mentally. Uh, so even though we expect to see a full recovery from Eagle, his injuries do cast a somewhat worrisome shadow on his future. And so I think for that, those reasons, the public perception is mistaken a bit. Wow. I, I, yeah, I, I like I like this argument. Hunter, what do you have? 
I just have a rebuttal in the sense that we're already seeing Ganon do the same thing at Discmania. His first in the bag, he's like, this is my stick MD3 that's clearly in a made. Same thing with PD, same thing with the PD2. Discmania and Prodigy fall into that same trap where the best stuff is the end of a made stuff and them not making him really push it. I know his bag's changed somewhat, but like for Discmania to capitalize, there needs to be a no end of a made plastic clock policy in their contract i don't know why that doesn't exist do, like, i think that is at, like the end of the round or I, I don't know man i'm following the rules that are put in front of me we, 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 okay. we should we should hunter you know hunter because, he's, like, he's always jumping down to... my throat you know yeah no I, I, well, you don't care hey, about you, the can i respond to hunter afterwards i raised my, you, I raised you my have hand. a tough yeah. job trevor we'll, we'll save job. all rebuttals I, we'll save all rebuttals for for after the round to make i just feel like if you have a rebuttal you should save it so the people that still have to go can potentially that was very that was very um Kind of very mean from Hunter. There. Yeah, he is. That was extremely vulture. mean. He's a point. Dustin vulture. was even holding up his hand, hand for a rebuttal. That's true. Uh, I was trying to his rebuttal. I I that's debatable. That's debatable. I wish I could go back in time and never say the rebuttal thing was even existed. Okay, yeah. that's true. You brought it up. You're the one that raised yes. your hand first. Um, but I, I asked the question. All right. I rest my case. I didn't rebut anything. Yeah, rest your case, uh, Brody. Okay, well now now you can take your turn. What do you what do you think about the Eagles thing? Do you agree? Do you disagree? The first thing I want to say is it's a good thing. I don't care about the points because I don't know if it was your idea or Silas's idea, but lime green and white, no one can read that. So I have no idea how many <laughs> points I have. No yeah, one three. else probably has any idea how many points I have. Everybody also, hold it up on the screen. I do want to say we're only a couple questions in, but Lucas is like 10 times better than everyone we had last season. So if you're new coming onto the show, you have a huge ceiling to, to, to match with what Lucas is bringing. He's bringing the spreadsheets. I love it. Um, all I have to say is, was this a long-term play? No one. I'm surprised. I was fourth year. The fact that all you guys skipped over this is wild to me. And that just shows you how uneducated you all are in the disc golf sphere. <laughs> this was a long play by this mania. Do you know who has one year on the contract left? Oh, Ezra Robinson. Yes, you're right. Oh, wait, no. Isaac Robinson too. Yes. Wait, who are they really good friends with? Hmm. Was this a long-term play? If them getting Gannon and Alden gets them Isaac and Ezra next year, they now have Gannon, Alden, Isaac, Ezra, Gavin, Kyle Klein. Kyle Klein, honestly, let's be real. He's probably out of there if that happens. <laughs> he's, probably no, he's probably nowhere to be found. But if they end up getting all those guys, I mean, what are we talking about here? I listen. Hey, I, I like that theory. I, I didn't really think about that. Okay. Uh, hands Hunter. up here. I don't like these hands up. I, I do not like these hands up. Hunter, please. go ahead. I just wanted to point out that it was kind of a well-documented fact on debate night last, last year that there was a rivalry between Isaac and Gannon. So do we really think Isaac's going to follow oh, Gannon? Like who can eat uh, the most the chick who, who can eat the most Chick-fil-A <laughs> nuggets? That's the rivalry. <laughs> what, what rivalry do people go out to dinner and like eat together? Please tell me they that. They're arguing. They're arguing. They're, they're, hey, it was Tyler Tulitsky that brought it up, but in real, in real <laughs> life, I just don't see Isaac following Gannon because they has to decide. It makes the brand decide whose shadow who's going to live in. And I think this is as bad as, and, and, this is and bad as an argument as, as, as Trevor trying to say that Aaron Gossage and Cole Rodolin are going to have a rivalry. That's, that's what level you're on. <laughs> no, right that's now. true. Um, no, it's not. Luke, no, that, that's true. And, and Brody actually mentioned to me, he said it's true 100%. Um, Lucas, go ahead now. Yeah, just really quickly. I, I did think about that Brody and I think it's a, a decent point, but I think that prodigy kind of put their eggs in Isaac's basket when they let him have his like creator series archive and stuff like that. Like it One seems year. like they're working with Isaac. I agree. I agree. But it seems like they're trying to keep him around. They didn't care about him they were wanting him to leave or they were at least expecting him to. And so uh, I think that's probably why I didn't, go that Lucas, route Lucas I would have not done that rebuttal because I said so many good things about you before and now I have to come back and say you're right prodigy does a really good job probably better than any other manufacturer of keeping their stars I 100% agree with you <laughs> good point Lucas <laughs> I mean their their biggest star of all time Will Shustrick he answers the phone if you call their sales department. So you tell me he's not keeping their, he's not keeping their stars. Huh? I mean, he's locked in for life. Oh, That's man. true. That's true. Um, I didn't say they kept their stars. I said they kept the stars they picked. So no, I just no, want I, to clarify. I, 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 I do I'm agree with you a little bit. 
Okay. Uh, also, I wanted to add one little wrinkle really quick. It is a little bit awkward when you got Gain and Burr out there throwing Rainmakers and Cloudbreakers. The Shadow of Eagle still that emerges. That is, <laughs> like, that is a little bit rough, but anyway. It is interesting. Um, all right, hey, good points all around, though. There, I yes. think there's a lot, of, a lot of ways to look at this, and I think we're going to really be able to assess this deal in, in like three to five years, and especially um, – just seeing what happens in the market and what happens on the course with these players. I think it'll be right now. There's a lot up in the air, but people certainly are leaning. You know, there's so much hype around MVP. It's hard not to just be like, man, they are an unstoppable force at the moment. Um, all right. We're going to jump out of that a little bit. A quick points update for everybody who's listening. Uh, Hunter's at nine points in the lead right now. Lucas and Dustin following at eight. And then Brody bringing up the rear at seven points. Everybody's still Appreciate quite that. close though. Yeah. Bring up the rear. Um, <laughs> on to the next I no topic. Idea how many points I had. Everybody else can see it. So I, I actually no are your shot, contacts in? Are your contact? All right, let's go no around. Shot. Dustin, how many points does Brody have? <laughs> I actually can't Just see it that well. Are I you guys like full screen? No, I'm small I screen and I can see it. I, I agree with Brody. It is a little difficult. It's All right, little Brody. What color do you want? What color do you want, Brody? Brody? What color do you want? Next week we'll change it. Flip. I don't give a flip. It sounds like you do. That's what's funny. Give him red. Run it. You want red? It'll look so bad. No, you're, keep, you're keeping green. Run it. Give me green. <laughs> you also didn't mention this <laughs> all of last year. Green. Give him a darker green. We'll slightly darken the green, maybe, but That's probably. Yeah, just slightly darken it. Um, all right, more, on to the next line or drop or data. lighter. Something. Yeah, we're <laughs> gonna go lighter. We're gonna make the we're gonna make the text the same color. Um, <laughs> yes. love. All right, we got the All Star Weekend coming up. Probably the second most important disc golf All Star thing happening this week. Um, if you haven't watched the Foundation, I think the the, the first. Two might be out by the time you're watching this episode. Uh, so you're going to check that out. But, you know, the Pro Tour All-Star Weekend, we got the blue team and the red team. The drafts came out. Here's my question. So we talk about this every year. Every year we pose the question, uh, what do they need to do to make the All-Star event better? That's usually the question we pose on the show. We say it over and over again because it kind of falls flat year after year. And we say, what could they do to make it better? Well, here's what I want to ask this time is, why do you believe the all-star event exists coming from the perspective of the pro tour? Why is the pro tour sit around each year and decide we're going to run an all-star event? And, you know, once you've established that, do you think their reasoning is warranted? Uh, or do you think that it's not at all? Um, Hunter, what do you think? Yeah. I mean, I mean, here's the deal, right? We've talked about this before. Every sport is struggling with their all-star thing. Um, because it's it's hard to get the players to care. And when it's hard to get the players to care, it's hard to get the fans to care. But at the end of the day, for disc golf, I feel like it's a fun, low-stress way for the Pro Tour to add another event to the schedule and a roundabout way to honor players that performed well last season. It also gives opportunity for advertising activate if they take advantage of them, like the different skills competition that are different than what goes on day-to-day -day during the normal Pro Tour um, season. And it, I think this is the key one here is it plays as a test with where it's positioned for them before the first event of the season, specifically for live broadcasting, because live broadcasting errors are a lot more forgiven during an all-star event over the first event of the year. So is all of it warranted and worth it? I think so. I mean, like I said, it's going to be hard to get fans really excited about it. It's equally hard, I think, to get players excited about it without some money on the line. But there, there's positives to its existence. So as long as behind the scenes, it's not stretching the Pro Tour thing and something they're super stressed about and putting a lot of time, energy, and effort into, which it doesn't feel like they are, um, then I think it's fine to kind of exist as is and, and serve as a, a spin-up for the Pro Tour uh, and for players. Okay, yeah. I mean, that that's certainly uh, one way to think about it. it is, it's impossible to know like what it actually is doing for their resources, time, and energy. Uh, but I do like the idea that maybe, yeah, maybe they like having a test, like, that's just kind of part of their uh, their process to get the season moving. Uh, Dustin, what do you think about the, uh, or sorry, Lucas, what do you think about the All-Star event? So I think with any All-Star event, any sport, including disc golf, there are three main functions, player recognition, fan engagement, and marketing. So first, the Pro Tour pools our top golfers in both divisions to celebrate and award their accomplishments and play in the previous season. I think that celebrating greatness is really important. I'm glad that they do it. Um, second, the all-star or also with well, the way they get rewarded is by getting to return to competitive play early. And especially this year, they get to play on the, the first course that they're going to be playing a tournament on. So that's a reward in and of itself. Second, the all-star event showcases just how talented the top players are to fans. The distance event is highly anticipated every year. I show my friends who don't like disc golf, like check out this 700 foot shot. Uh, the all-star event as a whole creates an environment for showing off, which fans love. And finally, marketing. This looks different across different sports based on who the audience of the marketing is. 
And I think disc golf is unique because it markets to people outside of the sport. It doesn't market as much to people outside of the sport as much as inside the sport. And that's a problem, but it, it is true nonetheless, I think. I, I think that the DGPT has yet to find something that really interests non-golfers other than maybe throwing far. So I think what they're ultimately marketing for is the start of the season. The all-star season event or the all-star event is the preseason or kickoff for fans and players alike. For fans, it's a low stakes way to get people re-engaged with their favorite player before the season really gets into swing. The NBA and NFL both have preseason college teams have blue and white games. The rekindling of excitement via low stakes competitive event is ubiquitous, ubiquitous across all sports. The DGPT just happens to combine their preseason play and their all-star event. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I, um, I definitely see that point and it is good to have kind of that buffer almost to be like, Hey, we're going to give people almost a, a week head start that the season's getting going, um, put everybody back in front of them, kind of readjust them and reacclimate them to the pro scene and, and all the players. So I, I do like that point for sure. Um, <laughs> did, did, did you change his color? <laughs> Brody, Brody's color is now gone to white. Um, so I was, white. Silas is on it. Um, well, Brody, what do you think about the All-Star event? Why do you think the Pro Tour is running it, and should they be? Yeah, so to answer your question, I'm like, why Why are they running it? I have no idea. Do they have <laughs> any idea? I don't know either, man. I don't, I don't know. Because why the heck are we having an All-Star event start a new season? That makes absolutely <laughs> no sense at all. The, the, the timing, I've said it once, I've said it a million times. The timing makes absolutely no sense unless it's simply like Hunter was saying, a way for them to put out an event and test things out and just figure out the kinks. They've gone, they've gotten even more to the point of like trying to not, you know, fake us out on like, this is an actual event by like, Hey, you know what? Let's just do it at the same course that the first tournament's going to be at before. <laughs> it was like, before it was like, Hey, no, this is in Florida. This is going to be down in uh, Orlando or, Oh, it's uh, out in Arizona. Now it's like, no, we're just going to do it at the same course that you guys are going to see the following week. I, I, to me, it makes absolutely no sense. Um, I, I don't understand it. I know people are going to be excited because they haven't seen disc golf in a while, but to me, I think that should be for the first event, or you could have done like a champions event where get all the past FPO and MPO champions from the previous season, have them come in and play a, a pre-tournament that you can run tests on and stuff. The all-star event makes no sense. There's like no information. They talked about bringing in like specialists for certain events. I can't find that anywhere. Uh, what are we doing here? Yeah, I will say the lack of information is, uh, is a bit odd. Um, I'm not really sure what they're what they're thinking how they expect people to get super engaged if they're not even sure what to expect from the event i mean we were trying to film grip locked on monday and we were like looking for the format and couldn't even find it so that's where that's at uh all right dustin you agree you think it, you, you have any idea why they're running this i'm kind of on brody's side man i honestly don't really know if they have a true vision of why they're doing this either i mean i, I do think some of it might just be that other sports have it and so they feel like they should too and maybe it's like some type of legitimacy play to match up with other traditional sports who include all-star events in their own circuit um i do think that there is something to be said about being able to do a test run for live coverage and post-produce content also test your social media team get them used to you know building graphics and throwing out stuff like rather quickly and just kind of give everyone some reps on a low stakes event where you know, you're really not taking too much of a risk that things go wrong. You can also test new equipment. Maybe you test some new segment ideas. You know, maybe you test some new types of footage. I don't know. Like, there's there's different little things that you could do with it. Um, I do think there's potential for a good all-star event out there somewhere for disc golf. I mean, I do like the idea of skills competitions. I also like the idea of match play because we don't really get to see it hardly anywhere else. And it is a fun format to watch top players compete in. So I think there is something there. But I do think it's weird to be at the beginning of the season rather than in the middle or the end of the season, like a mid season break or like a finale you know at the end i also don't like that it's based on last year's rankings i want the here and now best players um i think bringing in old legends could be a cool twist as well like bring in a ken climo bring in barry schultz like bring in some old people to kind of just bring that that, that tie into it or something like that uh again i'm not sure what the best strategy is but it seems like they're sold on it now and if they stop that might even now look off-putting if they you know it's not working out when they decide to, to put it like that might look bad. So yeah, I'm not really sure what the right direction is. That is true. It kind of could be like a runaway train at this point where they've, they've started the process and there's nowhere to stop. Hunter, what do you have to say? I just have a rebuttal against Lucas's point. Cause one of the yeah. main points was the preseason and preseason is popular in a lot of sports, but they're team sports because I think preseason exists to like 
for the NBA, try out people who are on like one day contracts and try out different lineups and stuff like that. The people who don't play is the LeBron James, and Steph Curry. They'll go out for a little bit here and there, but they're not getting reps in, in the preseason because why? You're just putting wear and tear on their body for no reason. In individual sports, it just doesn't make sense to me because like if we're going to all show up and you expect us all to take it seriously, why isn't this going to count for anything? That's why I don't think we ever see it in individual sports. So if that's the Pro Tour's reasoning, I my genuine opinion is that it's just they just want something to test everything. I think that's even why they put it on the same course this year is because I think they're worried about Wi-Fi and stuff out there. And they're like, hey, if we do the all-star event here, we can test it. I think that's the existence, and I think it's not that deep. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, Lucas, do you have any anything to, to reply back to that? Yeah, I think kind of the same way that Hunter was talking about, like testing out one day contracts, this gives the fans a chance to see like the highest level players throw their new discs. Like whenever we have Eagle going to MVP, I know he's not going to be at the event, so probably a bad example, but Gannon going to Dismania, if, if they're playing bad for the first few events of the season because they're not getting used to discs, then we might not have a chance to see them. Um, and this gives us like a, a highlight of those players with their new discs, kind of similar to what we see in the preseason, I think. But one of your he, big points yeah. was the was marketing, and I think that the biggest marketing play you can have is that you haven't seen Gannon Burr throw Disc Mania or Eagle McMahon throw MVP and throw him on a feature card, and boom, now people are way more interested. Versus, I've already seen Gannon, and he sucked with Disc Mania. I saw it last week. That could be a whole different thing if he's on that feature card. So, uh, I don't know. I think it kind of if if marketing is a big play for him like that, then I think that kind of takes the blow away from a potential season kickoff the next week. Yeah, I don't hate that. Um, yeah, I, I do think... hate the using of Olympus, by the way, for all stars and the first yeah, of the season terrible. that you're going to create a ton of redundancy when it comes to content around those two weeks. And it's going to make one of the two stale. You know, yeah. one of the two events is going to be stale because of that. I, I see it's um, got to be to test the Wi-Fi. I, I agree with you. That's probably yeah, what it is. But think... it just does not look good. That redundancy is not stale, good. Dustin. What's that? <laughs> I won't make it stale. All right. <laughs> you have sure. my word. Okay. I, I think I see uh, the point <laughs> where it could be like, you know, kind of like everybody was saying, get get things moving, get things tested, give people reps. And I, I do see Lucas's point in that Wild. it is sometimes good to give people that weak buffer to like restart the engine that is disc golf fandom before jumping into the tour. I think it is just weird that it has the identity of an all star game, because like Dustin mentioned, it's odd having that at the beginning of the season. Uh, so there's just like a few things that are intertwined that make it for a an odd combination of a product. That's what the all star event is at this just point. Just imagine getting on a plane and the captain coming over and be like, Psh, well, let everyone know uh, this is my first flight of the year. We're going to be testing out a few things. Uh, let us know how it goes. <laughs> Like, what, I mean, I, what are we doing? Why are we testing stuff out at an actual live event where paying, this is my big thing. They're doing all these new tier si su subscription stuff. If they fail with this thing, they're going to lose a lot of people. No one's going to want to pay for this. So Birdie. test this stuff out when no one can see. Sorry. Birdie's about the people. That's what it comes down to. He's he a man of people. He doesn't he want to see the people hurt, the new <laughs> tiers. Um, all right, we're going to move into our last topic before the final topic. And uh, this one I drew up just because I think there are a few big name players here that we're not really sure what their expectations are going to be this season due to some injuries. So I want to know who has the biggest question mark surrounding them related to their injury as we assess expectations for the 2024 season. Paige Pierce, obviously coming off of uh, quite a traumatic injury last season. Uh, and then Paul McBeth or Eagle McMahon, uh, those two kind of with a little more mysterious shoulder injuries, um, but, you know, potentially not as severe as, you know, snapping your, your ankle or leg like Paige did. So I want to know who has the biggest question mark as we just assess their expectations for the 2024 season. Lucas, who do you think? I, I think without a doubt, it's Eagle. His injury has been the most persistent. It's had the most impact on him and it has the greatest impact on the field. Uh, with Paige's injury, she broke her leg, like you said. We know a rough timetable for that recovery. Plus, at 33, it's not as though she was just coming into her own last year anyway. With Tatar's rise to dominance, we heard Paige make comments that she didn't care about winning, and although, even though she tried to mop up those comments, it hasn't been very convincing. So with new players like Holland Hanley rising to meet Tatar, the old guard of Cat, Paige, and Hokum is fading fast, and her injury means less for the field. With Paul's injury, we kind of already know what the possible outcomes are here based on the information we have. He gets the sim cells and it works and he's back, or it gets re-injured and he's out for the season with injury. So yes, disc golf is not arguably better when Paul is playing, similar to Tiger in golf, but also similar to Tiger. He's more out there as a legend than a week-to-week -week competitor. 
So though he's always a force to be considered, his departure for the year would not mean as much as Eagle for the field. Uh, finally, Eagle's injury. This injury happened in late 2021. It's now the start of 2024. That means this injury has prevented him from a full tour for four straight seasons. It impacts him the greatest personally because of his new sponsorship. MVP has invested in him for the next five years, and so there's a dual pressure for him to play, but also to stay healthy as, as a result. So if this injury persists, I think that significantly damages his stock long-term as an asset to, to companies, as well as the immediate hit MVP is going to take for him not playing. Uh, finally, Eagle had one of the best finishes to the season last year. We know that he has the talent and skills so we can stay healthy. So without a doubt, the strength of the field is way higher with Eagle in it. And I think he's uh, primed to play his way to the top player talk with Calvin, Gannon, Isaac, and Rick if he can stay healthy. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, I think those are good points that, you know, he certainly is. Uh, when you mention those three names, he is the one that is probably the most likely to win week in and week out, and that, and that definitely uh, carries weight when talking about um, – who's going to have an impact on the tour. So, um, all right, Brody, do you agree? Well, who do you think is the biggest question mark? The thing I find the most interesting with this list is two of them are similar. One is kind of the outlier and the outlier being Eagle McMahon page and Paul have built their brands off of being dominant world champions. I'm the best to be, to, to be a world champion. It has to come through me. To, with Eagle, I don't get the same vibes there. So like the expectations that Eagle has, like, yeah, we all know he's one of the greatest players right now in disc golf, but I don't think he has these expectations that Paul and Paige do. Paul's kind of been in this weird spot the last couple of years of where he hasn't been as dominant tournament, you know, every tournament, but he shows up at the majors. He's still competitive at the world's championships, which is just crazy with him kind of battling some of the injuries he has. The one that sets it apart for me is Paige. Like I think it's a no brainer because this type of injury that she had is, is a huge major injury. It's on her lead leg. What is that going to do for your head? As far as like just trusting it throughout the season, you tweak it once. Are you now pulling out? Or are you like, no, I'm going to keep playing. There still is this idea that Paige is the only one that can really compete with Kristen when they're both playing at the highest level. I think it's a Paige Pierce situation. I, I think she's the answer, no brainer. Um, and it's going to be very interesting, I think, early on to see just how much she trusts the surgery and her physical therapy. Yeah, there's no doubt that uh, whenever you have a leg injury like that, and I mean, obviously you've experienced this, just trusting those legs again can be difficult, especially when you're doing something strenuous on it. Um, I think it was Gannon Burr who had uh, a knee injury or something along those lines. He did an lines. ACL when he was 16, right. I think. And he he had a lot of trouble just getting back to throwing forehands and trusting that leg again because you're just so scared of re-injuring it. And that is certainly a factor considered when she had a very serious injury. So that will be one to watch. Um, Dustin, who is the big question mark for you? Yeah, so I'm sticking with, you know, the, the, the nature of the question, which is the question marks being related to the injury and not anything else. And so for me, when I look at Paul Macbeth and his injury, I'm honestly not sure how serious his injury is or how limited he will be. Um, I didn't really see anything major about his injury, and it seems like he was mostly fine getting back into shape. I think the question marks that surround Macbeth are way less about the injury. It's more about how he looks after some of the lows he had results-wise last year, how strong the competition has gotten around him uh, in the MPO field in general, where it's not as easy to be as dominant as it used to be. And I think it's also, he's got a lot on his plate now. He's got the foundation. He's starting a new family. You know, like, can he still keep up with, you know, the pack. I mean, I think that's where the question marks are, not necessarily the injury. Now, I think Brody made some really good points about Pierce's injury. Like, it is a serious injury. She broke uh, bones in her lead leg. A tip fib is no joke at all. I will say some encouraging signs have been some of the content that she has put out showing herself throwing, and it seems like, you know, she's getting her footing underneath her, so to speak. No pun intended there. Um, but I think that the question marks around Paige, yes, the injury, but it's also about the mixed signals of motivation. Because if you looked at some of her interviews from last year, you couldn't really tell, you know, if she had that killer instinct or not and all that jazz. So I feel like that is, is where a lot of the question marks are. Now, Eagle's the biggest question mark because as Lucas said, this injury's been around forever. It's been lingering for a very long time. We know his motivation. We know that he wants to be one of the best. It's clear that disc golf is his focus with some content sprinkled in, but the shoulder situation has hurt him for a while, limited his forehand, taking him out of seasons at times. And he's got a new sponsor, a new bag that he can't even throw yet with his right hand. Like this is tough. 
Yeah, I, I do think, you know, <laughs> when it comes to Eagle, one of the the big things is <laughs> we just want to see him playing again. I, I think a lot of people, you know, who watch this at golf, full strength. At yeah, that. when with, with Eagle, the last few years, it's just been like, we want this guy in the field. It's disc golf is more exciting when Eagle is playing just because of the things he could do. And yeah, at full strength, uh, because, you know, that's part of his game is being able to throw shots that nobody else could throw. Um, all right, Hunter, wrap it up for us. Who is, is your big question mark with these injuries? Yeah, I think, I mean, obviously there's question marks surrounding all of them as everyone's touched on, but one angle that I don't think anyone's, it's the angle that I am thankful because it's the only angle I have notes on is in my opinion, it has to be Paul McBeth. Um, Eagle and Paige, we we know their timeline. We we know they already went through surgery. We already have at least an answer from doctors and surgery is like, what's going to happen? What are we looking at here? Are there questions surrounding their future performance? Absolutely. Uh, but we at least know when a return's happening and kind of the structure as to what's about to happen. Paul, we have all kinds of questions in regards to even his timeline. He seems to be intending to play the chess.com invitational next week, but this is using new treatments with the stem cell shots that don't have a ton of precedent. Um, and then it seems like if this doesn't really work and when he's still dealing with pain and you know limited mobility and all of that, then surgery is his next option. If he goes to surgery, it could be season ending. It could be a situation where he tries to rush back to play worlds at courses he designed. You think Paul wants to be at this world championship. So it leaves us with Paul literally questioning, will he even be playing this season? Much less, not necessarily how will he be playing, but will he be playing? And I think that's a much bigger question to answer there. Um, so yeah, I think for me, start of the season, there's all eyes on Paige and Eagle for sure, but all eyes on Paul McBeth as to what's going on with his injury in general. Yeah, I, I think that's a good point because I do think that um, I think that Paul, when it comes to Paul, it is sometimes just a matter of like he doesn't he's not one of the more vocal ones. Uh, if you're following him on social media or just kind of keeping up with him, yeah, we're not really sure what he's going to do. And you also you mentioned he has very personal ties to two events this season, one being at a course he owns in Florida and then another being at a course he he designed in the World Championship, the tournament he's quite fond of. So I think that d always creates an interesting variable when you have a player who might be dealing with injury but could force it if there's an event that they really want to be at. Um, so yeah, it's certainly going to be interesting to watch, you know, it disc golf did not have a culture of injuries for the longest time. It wasn't something that was part of this game, uh, really, but as things have ramped up and become more serious, we're seeing it happen more and more and, uh, it's never fun to see, but you know, it's certainly, um, certainly going to be a part of the sport moving forward. We just hope that everybody can get healthy and stay healthy. Um, all right. We have finished our normal round. We've got Hunter and Lucas tied at 17 points, moving on to our final topic, Brody and Dustin, great efforts today. They will not be moving on. Um, all right, we're going to get on to the last topic today. This one is quite fresh. Uh, the Pro Tour recently announced the creation of the Q Series. Very fun name. A new set of events designed to allow aspiring players a chance to earn a tour card for the following season. What are your initial takeaways from this new project? And do you see any flaws in the framework as it grows and evolves um, and as things move on? Um, we'll do... Um, Lucas is the new guest, so I'll let you choose, Lucas. Do you want to go first or second? I'll take this one first. Oh, he wants to lead off. Okay. All right, go for it, Lucas. I, I think this is a great idea in theory. As someone who's on this lower-level pro field, I was very excited for this, uh, excited to get a chance to earn my tour card without having to rely on ratings to get into big tournaments. I would be able to earn my way into it myself. Um, but it, it's just incredibly late in the season planning game to be announcing this. I've already made my schedule through June. Um, and they just announced this like this past week. Um, so this is a series of events also that's supposed to be geared towards low level pros who want to earn a tour card. I think instead of making the decision for this series with that in mind, the pro tour chose to make only eight events spread out all across the country. So the demographic of disc golfers who want to play the Q series probably aren't going to be able to spend money to travel all over the country to qualify. I know I'll, I'm from Knoxville, Tennessee, so I'll be playing Huck Central in South Carolina, and I'll maybe make it out to the Kansas City Wide Open in Missouri. Uh, but outside of that, I mean, traveling one of those tournaments would require a flight, and that's not going to get picked up by one of my sponsors. I'd have to pay for it myself, and that's just not something I'm interested in doing. Um, so I think, once again, it's just a, a half-baked idea from the DGPT that could have been well thought out, could have been really interesting, and could have been a great way to cultivate young new talent. But it's instead, at least for me, just a disappointment in execution. Um, I, I think in the future to kind of help with this, we could have all A tiers with a certain threshold of players 
be eligible to be part of this Q series or maybe make another, um, like if, if an A tier has been around for long enough, it could qualify to be a Q series. Uh, just so that way it's more accessible to the demographic demographic they've actually created this concept for. Um, but as far as, as far as flaws in the framework of the idea of a Q series itself, I think there are other sports that have qualifying leagues, tours, events. So as long as they focus on modeling after that, I think it's difficult to stray, uh, too far off track. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I definitely can see those points, obviously as somebody who is like you mentioned, like. Uh, kind of a local pro who's aspiring towards the tour. You certainly have good perspective on that. And um, yeah, some good points there. All right, Hunter, what do you think? Do you agree? What are the, what are the things you see with this new Q series? Uh, yeah, I'm stoked for it. I'm very, very excited. This is what the silver event should have been all along. I actually love that they kept the logo silver as an ode to the old silver events and what they have now become. It's beautiful. Uh, it made me kind of tear up when it was announced. For the initial season, I think this format's great. Uh, it leaves room for growth over the years. It becomes more serious and the tour itself grows. To some of Lucas's points, um, I didn't take this as half-baked. You know, I understand the late announcement. I can understand where that's coming from a little bit. But the idea behind this, as it grows and as it develops, it, it should be a tour that is happening that is qualifying you, which means it's going to be all across the country. I don't like the idea of A tiers being able to qualify based on merit or anything like that. I think the Pro Tour needs to keep control over this, needs to be really picky and choosy, and do something that flows well, because eventually you want people to be able to make a living on the Q series and be able to earn their tour card that way and then make it to here. I think this is a long-term thought-out plan, not necessarily for the short term. I think it would have been for the short term. Some of these, your boxes would have been checked, but then they would have had to be reformatted in the long term. So I think this year it's going to feel like a bunch of separate tournaments more than it's going to feel like one cohesive tour. Uh, it'll be mainly local players feeling, filling each field, but it's exciting to see at least a clear road to the pro tour and see it start to become more competitive as to who has the ability to call themselves a touring professional up to this point. I, I've played on the pro tour. So am I a touring pro? No. Now you have a clear definition of like, this is how you become a touring pro. This is how you earn a tour card. And I think that they're structuring this for future growth and they're structuring this for a future tour that they have a clear vision of instead of a, a short term thing. I'm very excited for it. I think it's going to be a lot of fun to follow these storylines throughout the year and give us more storylines next year as to this person came out of the. What can they do on the full tour? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, good points there too. I, I kind of uh, agree a little bit more with Hunter there. I think that, um, you know, the having the Q series the way it's laid out, the best way to think about it is kind of like he mentioned, the tour name can be a little confusing um, because I think people expect to be able to hop on that tour, but it is going to function at least at the beginning more like individual events, almost tryout type events. That's definitely the way it's going to flow. But I think when you talk about the pro tour and all the plans they've laid out that are like long term plans, this is one of the long, probably longest term plans they've ever laid framework for because I mean, they haven't even finished, you know, getting the the pro tour fully to a place that can sustain itself and all the pros can make livings on, you know, laying down a Q tour or a qualifying tour beneath it is is something that, you know, won't be, um, you know, a huge, huge functioning arm of the pro tour probably for years down the road. But at least it's a start, like Hunter mentioned, to kind of pull some storylines and start to see some players emerge. And I think that's good. But but good points on both ends. Um, Hunter is our is our champion today. He uh, just just edging out Lucas there winning the first episode of the season. So congratulations, Hunter. Anything to say? Basement Hunter's undefeated. Uh, it's going to be tough to beat down here. You know, there's interesting fumes. It's ice cold. So, you know, I'm on my toes nonstop. Definitely thought I was done for when Lucas brought out the spreadsheet, but I was able to bounce back and, you know, <laughs> proud of my performance today. Excited for excited for a season here. The spreadsheet. Lucas checked two of the boxes today, um, which was number one, brought in a custom spreadsheet, and then number two, used used a few big words today. Uh, what was the one? Ubiquitous? <laughs> was, was that the word? Ubiquitous. It was. Ubiquitous. I mean, that. Yeah. Google it. I, I about fell out of my chair. It, you, <laughs> you throw in a word like that, it's like automatic points. It's a good thing I put a limit on my points this year, or else I probably would have just spammed the button at that point. Um, <laughs> all right. Hey, great episode, though. Hopefully, you enjoyed listening. I do have a little bit of a call to action. Um, are we ripping that on camera? No, the fans <laughs> lost today. I was going to rip it if I would have won, but. Uh, ah. It is, it is what it is. I'm going to rip. I have this Brixton card. I'm just kidding. Oh. Um, we do have a bit of a call to action though, because this year, you know, I always come up with the topics for debate night, but this year I want help from the audience. We had a lot of fun getting user uh, or viewer generated topics on the off season podcast. I'm going to bring that to this show. So we'll always do some things with current events, but 
We have a QR code, Silas, so you can throw that on the screen. If you scan this QR code here, it'll take you to a Google form where you can submit any topic that you want to see on this show. It can have to do with uh, current events. You know, if something happened at the tournament on the Pro Tour and you want people to talk about it, throw it up there. But Or if you just think it's an interesting subject to debate anything at all, uh, just throw it in there. I'll be looking through there week to week to pull out different topics that we can go over because I always like having a bigger uh, pool to choose from. And sometimes I miss things. So, um, and Hunter nap, the, the, the nighttime is looking very successful. Look it down, man. That's a win. That's a That's dub. pretty much the greatest card I've ever seen. Scott Stokely and Ken Climo auto. <laughs> that's, that's insane. Um, also comment down below, uh, comment down below. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure to leave a like buy grip lock merch. And, uh, what color do you think Brody's uh, scoreboard should be next week if you couldn't see it as well. Um, other than that, we'll see you next week.